All right, good morning and welcome to our service this morning. The title for this morning's message is Extravagant Devotion. And if you have a Bible, turn to the book of Mark, chapter 14. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. And we'll just begin with a word of prayer. So, Father, we thank you for this time that we can gather around your word. I pray that you would help us to understand what you're saying to us so that we might uh, apply the principles we do learn in our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Mark 1, 14, 1. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money, and he sought an opportunity to betray him. Mark tells us that the temperature among the Jewish leaders toward Jesus had been steadily increasing for some time. The devious plan for his murder began some time earlier right after he healed the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath. It continued following his cleansing of the temple, and it came to a boiling point with the parable of the evil tenants, which they understood to be about themselves. And so the scribes, Pharisees, and the chief priests have had enough of Jesus, and they begin to actively pursue a strategic way to do away with him. And only the recognition of the popular favor Jesus enjoyed and the fear of a Jewish uprising kept them from accomplishing their purpose. Nevertheless, the men gather at the home of Caiaphas, the high priest, to determine a way to ultimately seal his fate. We pick up that story in John's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 47. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So we sort of see what's behind their thinking, their concern about their place. Verse 49, But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Meanwhile, Jesus, having left the temple for good and after after delivering the Olivet Discourse uh, regarding the judgment of the temple and the end of the age, retired to Bethany, about two miles east of Jerusalem. There he accepted an invitation to dinner in the home of a man known as Simon the leper. Who was Simon the leper? Well, one can only speculate, but it's likely that at one point Jesus had healed him, and perhaps this was Simon's opportunity to show his appreciation. 
Now, something to point out is that while at Simon the leper's house, the general perception was that Jesus is among friends. And that means he can relax, take it easy, and enjoy a meal. With a violent storm brewing back in Jerusalem and while his enemies scheme their next move, Jesus avoids the building tension by banqueting with those who truly appreciate him. Lazarus was there. Mary was there, and so was Martha. In fact, it was Martha who hosted the event and served the dinner. In addition, the disciples were there, and one can only imagine how many others in attendance were there. In other words, this had the potential to be a terrific evening of food, laughter, and meaningful fellowship among friends. We pick it up, Mark 14, verse 3. And while he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. John identifies the woman as Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. Sometime during the evening, Mary, who loved to sit at Jesus' feet, which, by the way, was something only a true disciple would do, unexpectedly makes her way through the crowd, approaches her beloved Jesus, breaks the neck of a priceless alabaster flask full of expensive perfume, and pours out her future on his head. Now, without going into too much detail, this flask filled with imported Indian ointment called nard, was extremely expensive, about a year's wages, and was most likely a family heirloom, something passed down from one generation to another, from a mother to a daughter. To put it another way, this item was valuable, important, and irreplaceable. Now, anointing the head of a guest was a common custom in that day, but in this context, it was clear that Mary's action expressed more than a passing glance, more than a common courtesy shown to a friend, but one of pure devotion. In other words, this was a premeditated act, something she put a lot of thought into. I can almost imagine uh, her looking for something of value in her home as she prepares for the evening. And there on the shelf was her most prized possession, the perfume given her by her mother. Without hesitation, Mary takes it from his place. And much like the widow and her two coins in Mark chapter 12, she gives all that she has to Jesus. And from the story, it doesn't appear as though she cares at all what others think or say. You see, in breaking the neck of the flask, Mary holds nothing back. The broken container has now served its purpose and would be of no further value. And as for the nard, not only did she anoint Jesus' head, but according to John, she poured it out on his feet as well. This was an incredible act of humility, love, worship, and devotion, something the disapproving disciples would take note of. And the house was now filled with the fragrance of costly perfume. Now, knowing what the immediate future holds, I wonder if at this point Jesus begins to reflect on the sobering words of the psalmist. You know, in our day, this comforting text is often used at funerals and memorial services. But just think about the timing of this anointing and the anguish that Jesus knows he must endure for our sake. And these words come alive. They come alive with the reality of betrayal, mistreatment, suffering, shame, and crucifixion. You see, Jesus knows what this anointing is all about because he knows what's coming. Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse 4, 
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You, here it is, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, I've been accused of being a little too extreme at times, a little too aggressive, even a little too loud, especially when it comes to worship. And if you happen to think that perhaps I'm too invested, let me put your mind at ease. You see, we're simply attempting to do what the writer of Hebrews said to do. Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. In other words, we're to sing out his praises without apprehension. We're to worship him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light without shame. I mean, the worship of Jesus is the language of heaven where every creature bows low and where thousands upon thousands have been and forever will be worshiping him. However, as much as I do love to worship, I've never dropped a year's salary in one offering like Mary did. But that's not really the point of the story. The point of the story is this. Extravagant devotion to Jesus, as costly as it may be, just might make some a tad nervous. You see, to some, what we do for the cause of the kingdom won't make any sense. Sometimes it might even make some people mad. What are you doing going to church again? Haven't you heard enough? What's up with you and your prayer life? What's with your new friends? How much money are you giving anyways? And what's that I hear? You want to be a missionary? You want to do what? You want to waste your life by telling others the good news about Jesus? You see, extravagant devotion isn't all about what one gets from this relationship. Rather, it's about what one gives because of their love and devotion to the Savior. And Mary demonstrates this about as clearly as anyone can because she gave Jesus everything. Her most valued earthly possession was poured out on the one who is to be valued above all, and she wouldn't be alone. Another example of extravagant devotion is found in the second book of Samuel, where David, king of Israel, brings the Ark of the Covenant to the tent of the Lord, and regardless of what others think or care, including the opinions and or objections of his own wife, David is determined to worship God. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 12. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And look at her response. And she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed each to his house. Verse 20, 
And David returned to bless his household. But Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel honored himself today. She was being sarcastic. Uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michael, it was before the Lord. It was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord, and I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. And so much like the life experiences of Mary, David, and countless others throughout history, not everyone will be thrilled with one's extravagant devotion to God, and I guarantee not everyone will understand. This reality shouldn't surprise us at all, yet neither should it deter us from continuing to express our heartfelt devotion as we worship. Listen to what the psalmist writes in Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. For what purpose? To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. In 1883, C.T. Studd went to hear Dwight L. Moody speak. His soul was stirred afresh. Immediately, he began to tell others about Christ. Studd would later say that he had tasted all the pleasures of the world, for his father was extremely wealthy. But none gave him so much pleasure as bringing his first soul to trust in Jesus. Two years later, Studd sailed for China to join Hudson Taylor as a missionary. While in China, he dressed as a Chinese, ate Chinese food, and learned the Chinese language. Following his father's death, Studd, now 25 years old, was about to inherit a large sum of money. However, while reading the scriptures and while meditating and praying, he felt convinced that he should give his fortune away to show the world that he relied not on money, but on a living Lord. The Lord, he was sure, would bless him a hundredfold in non-monetary ways and provide him sufficient money to live on. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, he said, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. Naturally, they ran short of money often after that, yet they found God faithfully supplied them. Funds are low again, he said. That means God trusts us and is willing to leave his reputation in our hands. Studs answer to critics who said he was uh, too zealous, that he went overboard. Well, his response was simple. How could I spend the best years of my life in living for the honors of this world when thousands of souls are perishing every day? Like C.T. Studd, Jim Elliott's life was also set on sharing the gospel. And at 25, he and four other missionaries set out to bring the message of God's salvation to the people of Ecuador. The quote from Eliot, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose, succinctly communicates his heart of devotion to his God. Jim Eliot and his friends were murdered in 1956 by the very people he had come to serve. He was only 28 years old at the time of his death, and many said, what a waste of these young lives. What a waste. Yet in his heart, Jim Elliott had already settled that issue. Even as a student at Wheaton College on Sundays, he would often ride the train into Chicago and talk to people about Christ. He once wrote of such a day, I cannot recall leading more than one or 
two into the kingdom. Surely this is not the manifestation of the power of the resurrection. I feel as Rachel, he said, give me children or else I die. Back to our text in Mark. 14 verse 4, there were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. Now notice, sandwiched between this incredible act of devoted worship, which prepared Jesus for his upcoming burial, is the conspiring of the Jews in Jerusalem and the soon coming betrayal of one of his closest friends, Judas Iscariot. In fact, John writes that it was Judas leading a charge on behalf of the others who had, was absolutely incensed with Mary's offering. And with calculator in hand, a man who knew the price of everything and apparently the value of nothing, instantly calculated the certain waste of something so costly. And it isn't long before the others voice their displeasure as well. Why this waste? Mary, what are you doing? John 12, 4. But Judas Iscariot, one of his 12 disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Listen to what John writes. He said this not because he cared about the poor but because he was a thief, because his heart was bad. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Well, as we can only imagine this, this wonderful dinner at Simon the leper's house, this time supposedly spent amongst friends, was now beginning to unravel into an indignant chaos. Everybody's angry. And all that remained of Mary's extravagant gift was the evaporating aroma of expensive perfume. And they reviled her. They scold her. Now the word scold here means that they snorted at her like a herd of angry horses. Some of you might know what that sounds like. How humiliating for Mary. She had given her all to Jesus and was now being reprimanded by his closest friends. You see, the disciples believe they knew the mind of Jesus, but once again, they are mistaken. And the temperature in this room intensifies. In his commentary on Mark's gospel, J.C. Ryle writes this, the spirit of these narrow-minded fault finders is only too common. Their followers and successors are to be found in every part of Christ's visible church. There is never wanting a generation of people who decry what they call extremes in religion and are incessantly recommending what they term moderation in the service of Christ. If a man devotes his time, money, and affection to the pursuit of worldly things, they do not blame him. If he gives himself up to the service of money, pleasure, politics, they find no fault in that. But if that same man devotes himself and all he has to Christ, they can scarcely find words to express their sense of folly. He is beside himself. He is out of his mind. He's a fanatic. In short, they regard it as waste. Mark 14, 6. Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. In Jesus' defense of Mary, he recognized in her generosity a beautiful expression of love and devotion which possessed a deeper significance than she could have ever possibly understood. 
You see, Mary's motives were pure, spirit-led, and spontaneous. In other words, she didn't measure her gift in grudging drops, one for Jesus' head and one for his feet. Mary gave all she could. Furthermore, her gift was appropriate because of the approaching hour of Jesus' death. And since he would suffer a criminal's death, there would be no other opportunity for anointing his body. And so this act of worship, this step of putting Jesus first, even before the poor, which everyone understood they had a responsibility to serve, was something completely ordained by God. And Mary, to the displeasure of most everyone in the room, did what she could. Mark 14, 10. Then Judas Iscariot, who we're going to speak about next week, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad. Remember, they were looking for a way to do away with him at the beginning of this chapter. Well, now they've got their opportunity. They were glad and promised to give him money, and he sought Judas an opportunity to betray him. Well, apparently Judas had had enough. He had followed Jesus for three years, listened to countless sermons, witnessed multiple miracles, and even watched demon-possessed people set free. Yet for whatever reason, for whatever reason, Jesus was not the Messiah that Judas envisioned. This wasn't at all what he had in mind for himself. And it's at this point in his life that he makes the fatal decision to get out while he still can. Mark writes that he looked for an opportunity to betray Jesus, one that would eventually lead him to selling his teacher for 30 pieces of silver, the amount paid for the price of a common slave. And once again, the prophetic words of the psalmist come to mind. Psalm 41, 9. We're going to spend some time on this text next week. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you delight in me. My enemy will not shout in triumph over me. But you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. Amen. By introducing the action of Judas Iscariot, Mark sharpens the contrast between the selfless act of Mary and the treachery burning in the heart of a friend. Remember in verses 1 and 2 of this chapter, the chief priests, scribes, and Pharisees are looking for an opportunity to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. And now in Judas, one of the twelve, one of his closest friends, they have their chance. You see, their primary concern was the possibility of a riot, of an uprising, but now they make plans to arrest him in the quiet of the night. Well, we'll have to stop right here for now, and we'll pick up the story next week. Well, Mark's, uh, excuse me, Mary's story is forever part of Mark's gospel because she demonstrated what happened in a life that has been touched by Jesus. What does her example tell us that Jesus wants from us? Well, I think it's clear. He wants our hearts. He wants our devotion. And he wants a people motivated by love, love for him. In other words, the gospel, this gospel, this good news is not an intellectual exercise where we simply accumulate religious information. Rather, it's a profound, intimate, life-transforming relationship with a God who loves us and who gave himself for us. You see, Jesus wants us to follow him as well. He wants us to trust him as well. And he wants us to have the courage to do what we have been called to do 
in honor of him. So let's devote ourselves to Jesus by our love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoings, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Secondly, let's devote ourselves to Jesus in our giving. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty has overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves, notice this, first to the Lord. They gave themselves first to God and then by the will of God to us. And finally, let's devote ourselves to Jesus as we worship. Romans 12, verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't be squeezed by this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So let's devote ourselves in our love, in our giving, and as we worship. Let's pray. So Lord, I thank you for your word to us this morning. I pray, Lord, that we, each and every one of us, would value you above any earthly possession or any other person or any other thing, that you would indeed be our greatest treasure, valued above all, I pray, Lord, we would live our lives in devotion to you in every way, in the way that we live, in the way that we talk, in the way that we uh, deal with other people, everything that we do, Lord, that we might live in honor of you. So, Lord, I thank you for each and every one that is listening right now, and I pray that you would be with them, encourage each one in this difficult time. Lord, I pray that we would continue to have an appetite for your word and um, just a yearning to spend time with you in prayer and in meditation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, and we'll see you next week.